Hey everyone, how you doing? Welcome to our CLE, our approved CLE on how to work remotely and still run a successful law firm. So uh, this is a popular one. We got a lot of registrants today. So we got a lot of people on the call. Let's make it interactive. Let's make it fun. We got some poll questions for you uh, so we can interact with the audience. Also, I want you to leverage your questions widget. If you see in the GoToWebinar control panel, it says questions uh, and there's a little triangle. You toggle the triangle and you'll see there's like a little thing in there and just say, hey, I can hear you, I can see you. So I know that we got, oh, all right, we got everything ready to go and Renee knows the drill, she's been here before. All right, rock on, let's continue. So um, a little bit about me. So why do I have any business talking about working remotely? Well, as it turns out, uh, I have a lot of business about talking remotely. And, and when I went through and I created this presentation, which is original, like this is the first time I'm giving it, I didn't realize how adapted I personally am to working remote. So um, a little bit about me, um, I run Rocket Matter. Uh, I am a husband, I'm a father, I got two kids, I got two dogs and a cat, I'm an animal lover. Uh, I used to code. I built the first version of Rocket Matter. Now I run Rocket Matter. Um, I like to write a lot. I'm an author. I volunteer for Little League, which um, I will be spending tonight uh, coaching those ungrateful little 13-year-old kids. And uh, I'm very, very anti-hate speech. I'm active in the Anti-Defamation League, and I'm always trying to be healthy. Please get in touch with me um, on LinkedIn. Uh, I love connecting with people. I love talking to people on email. It's Larry at rocketmatter.com. That's pretty much where I hang out. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned before, I founded Rocket Matter. I wrote Rocket Matter, the first version of it. Uh, the engineers that have taken over the mantle since then have done a much better job than me. Um, and now I kind of run the company. So the other, uh, so I do a, a lot of different things in, in, in this weird perch that I have of running a legal software company. I'm somebody who did not have an MBA. It's not that I had a law degree, I was an engineer. So when I started my company, I had to learn how to run a business. And then I started working with a lot of law firms and I realized that they didn't know how to run their law firms. And I had at least the engineering background and the exposure to software companies to kind of have some sort of like roadmap on what to do. So then I ended up writing this thing called the Lean Law Firm, which kind of encapsulates a lot of the ideas that I had come up with. And also I started uh, two podcasts as a result of Le the Lean Law Firm podcast and the 10 Minute Law Firm podcast. So if you're looking for some of the other stuff that I do, we do this uh, bi-monthly webinar series and we also have these podcast episodes. And there's a, a lot of this stuff is covered in some of the podcast episodes. Um, I also work remote six weeks every single summer. So every single summer, I work six weeks remote in Lee, Massachusetts. This is this, uh, and so this is a Florida bar CLE. So presumably a lot of people here are from Florida and you know how hot it gets down here in the summer. So I designed my life so that we'd be able to do this. And um, pretty much I need an internet connection and I'm able to do my thing. You know, I, I work on this porch and there's my dog. You can see him here. There's another one lurking around here somewhere. He just didn't make it into the picture. And I'm able to run my entire business uh, from this porch for the most part. Um, I have a green screen, you know, so I, I can host webinars and podcasts from this cottage in addition to just directing traffic here at Rocket Manor. Um, I have a Blue Yeti microphone and half the stuff I do, I'm not even wearing like pants. So, you know, I'm able to actually conduct everything I do. And if you see on LinkedIn, some of the videos that I do, they're done with just that green screen and that Yeti microphone or, or just even my computer. So it's, it's amazing what you're able to do. Um, and, you know, we really have this in our day, in our DNA, because my chief revenue officer, who maybe some of you have interacted with, uh, Jeff White, he, uh, he is in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, and the whole sales team is in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, and um, this is a picture of him in this RV that he, so before his time at Rocket Matter, he uh, traveled around the country with his children. His children were homeschooled. He built a business from this RV and worked remotely for 10 weeks in this thing with his entire family. So he's worked remotely. Um, and 
the the point is is that there's tools and, and ways to do this that are successful obviously legal is a little different and we're going to talk about the nuts and bolts for that okay so um before we get into the rest of the presentation um you know i want to uh, i'm going to launch a poll question and the question is what is your biggest challenge with working remotely you know is it is it maintaining engagement or focus is it is it effectively managing your time you know is it is it like you know dealing with distractions keeping your morale up communicating with your team like what is the major issue that you're having um because that if you by answering this and i encourage you to like answer this because it's more fun to answer this then i'll be able to really kind of customize this presentation depending on where the weak spots are uh, in the audience as a whole um so it's it's very helpful if you uh give me um any information right okay so we got a little bit over 50 percent of the people responding and we have well over 100 people on this um webinar so uh we have some good statistical information and okay so it seems like dealing with distractions and maintaining engagement and focus is like a big issue with working remote um community followed by communicating with your team effectively managing your time and keeping your morale up okay or other things also if there okay somebody uh was ahead um I, somebody used the questions widget to say what their typical issue is. Please use the questions widget if it's not here. Um, major issue, how to get clients signed up without being there in person. Um, I sign a wet signature on documents approximately 100 times a day. Okay, so there's like a lot of like actual physical work. Um, anybody else have any other issues would like to see it. Um, and then we have other questions that we're gonna ask along the way. All right, so, um, 91 percent um is all right so this number is really big uh it's the amount that remote work has grown over the past 10 years and that's i mean there's a lot of different factors at play here right but it's really gotten to be a big deal um and let's see what else do we have that i can tell you oh um so presumably on this call you know some of you may be on this call because you're interested personally in working remote uh, and being able to work in a distributed fashion, but also maybe some of you are on this call because you want to tr figure out how to manage a law firm and manage people that report to you that want to work remote. Because it's a big draw to be able to create a work environment if you can pull this off, right? Um, remote workers say they are likely to stay in their in their current job for the next five years, 13% more often than on-site workers. So it has a, a major draw in terms of retaining people and attracting people to your business. And uh, I am, am quoting a study here, which by the way, everyone's gonna get a copy of this presentation uh, and you can click on this and read it at your leisure. But um, there's a lot of really good information in the survey that I cite here. It was done with over 800 people that are uh, in all stages of working remote. Um, okay, other people are writing in. Technology is an issue. Keeping engaged with the marketplace. Um, monitoring or confirming work of employees. So basically keeping people accountable. Um, okay, and somebody said, uh, people brought into your firm. Aaron, if you could kind of elaborate on what you're talking about with a, uh, people being brought onto your firm without being there to nurture the relationship, if you could kind of explain that one a little bit to me, then maybe we could go into that as well. All right, so um, in terms of other uh, benefits and favorability in terms of working remote and not, like, so and, and when you're thinking about your staff, I, I really am a big believer that this, you get better staff if you are able to be able to pull this off. Um, I know that there's maybe a lot of solo practitioners out there that don't have staff, but if you do, um, you know, it's something to consider. Um, or if you're, if eventually at some point you're going to be growing, it's something to consider as well. So for people that really that it's important for them to work remote, a lot of it has to do with schedule flexibility. A lot of times that's called flex time, right? Um, workplace flexibility, where they're going to be, as opposed to just when they're going to be. Uh, Stock options, that's kind of a weird correlation kind of thing. I don't think that really has any play in terms of a law firm. Uh, transportation benefits, 73 more, in person, more important to remote workers. So for people with like awful commutes, you know, it's a big deal too. Um, and then uh, there's some other things that are correlated as well. Um, and the one thing that I wanna say is that you can lack an office and still have a very highly successful firm. 
So uh, these guys, uh, the Fisher Broyles guys, this is a large law firm. It's like an AMLA 500, AMLA 250 size firm. They have over a hundred attorneys um, and they've completely turned the big law model inside out. So the big law model is really known as the Cravath system. And the Cravath system has served very well for a long period of time. It, it's pretty amazing because Paul Cravath invented this system by observing how Thomas Edison and George Westinghouse ran their invention factories. And if, if any of you have read this awesome book that I've just read, it's called The Last Days of Night. Paul Cravath is, it's a historical fiction novel where they bring these people to life and Paul Cravath is the protagonist and he's representing George Westinghouse. So the whole idea is that, okay, well, if, if like it's okay, so all right, Carnegie has the steel factories and then there's the coal barons and all this industrial stuff was going on and it made sense how that could scale a certain way with, with when you had real hard tangible goods. But then you look at like guys like Edison and they're producing ideas. And the way Edison worked is he had a team of people creating these ideas and he was directing them. So Cravath's insight was if you can have intellectual work be done at scale, then it could also take place for a law firm. And then that's where that whole associates model came in and um, passing uh, some of the grunt work down to the associates and have you know the high le higher level partners do all uh, the, the bigger hitting. So that, that has made sense for a long time, uh, everybody in one place. These guys are completely distributed. They've turned it completely on its head. They don't really have an associate model. They're bringing in people from all over the country um, that are best of breed, and this is how they're stitching this law firm together. And if you're interested in hearing how they've set up their law firm and how they've been able to call it a distributed practice, uh, we interviewed them on the Lean Law Firm podcast, and they were, um, uh, you know, the two leaders, James Fisher and Kevin Broyles. Um, they gave us a good like 30 minutes or so talking about their vision for their firm and, and how excited they are to be able to present law in this new way. Um, you know, another major thing about working remote is that you might be able to attract the right talent or better talent. And that's what happened to me. Uh, so in my case, I had been through a number of like leaders of my sales team in South Florida, and I was not able to find the right person. Uh, so it took someone who wasn't here for me to be able to find someone that was able to run the ins and outs. It's a little bit different running a sales organization for a subscription service, you know, like Rocket Matter, than it is to find somebody who can run sales for like a real estate organization. So it took me years and multiple people before I found the right person. And it turns out that person wasn't here. So in order for me to get the right person, I had to be able to accommodate a remote employee. Okay, so it, it turns out that our, the world we live in is, is built for distributed work. And it, this is an extreme example, but I know people like this that like go to Thailand or wherever it is in the world and they work from there, um, you know? So there's, changes in the expectation of your clients right clients not all the clients don't necessarily want to see you i personally was involved with litigation for like seven years the amount of times i went to my lawyer's uh, actual office over those seven years was twice uh, the rest of the time we would go have lunch together we would meet for coffee we would discuss the case there he would call me on the phone um it just it wasn't that he had a, his office was beautiful it just wasn't that i ever had to go there right? Um, and I don't want to go there. If I can get by with a phone call or if I can get by with him coming to see me, I'm much happier as a business owner. Um, I don't want to have to go to the law office if I absolutely don't have to. If I have to go to a deposition or something like that, sure. But he never hosted depositions in his office anyhow. You know, they were always at like at a depot center or the opposing counsel's place or whatever it is. So, you know, there, there's certain kind of expectations on, on the part of, I think, younger consumers. And I'm like kind of in the middle, I straddle generations. I'm, I'm in my forties, so I'm not quite a millennial. I'm not quite a baby boomer. I guess I'm gen X, but you know, for me and, and, and for people younger than me, um, we don't want to go to a big stuffy law firm if we can avoid it. Uh, the other thing is that the technology that has evolved is 
completely suited for remote work. And we're gonna get into this. We're gonna talk about the different tools that you can use, but the internet has really opened up the way to uh, virtualized work. And so we're gonna get into the tools that we can use for video conferencing, for keeping all of our stuff organized, for all those types of issues. Um, the other thing is that travel has become easier. And this is uh, this might seem like a silly thing, but you're more likely to travel if it's more economical. And um, you know, so the proliferation of low cost air carriers, the ability to stay uh, in places and in, in like Rome and like two bedroom apartments for two hundred dollars a night, you know, through Airbnb and things like that, it's made moving around a lot easier and a lot cheaper. And uh, the last thing is that there's been kind of an explosion of different types of business support services that make working remote very, very doable. You have on the one hand, you have a, a whole bunch of business process outsourcing types of things. You have virtual receptionists, for example. You have um, Upwork where you can just go online and hire a graphic designer. You don't even know where they live to build you whatever it is that you need. You also have, um, other things at play as well, like you have things like WeWork and you have co-working spaces that, you know, now there's, you don't really need a five-year commercial lease. Uh, so there's all sorts of things happening right now that make it a perfect time, if you're interested in exploring this, to go for it. So no time like the present. Let's get into it a little bit. Uh, let me see if there's any other uh, questions right now uh, i guess one thing let's ask is let's let's pull the audience here for a second and let's 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 ask this how often do you work remotely are you already doing it um one to two days a week three or more days a week uh, i guess we're missing an option here for never so if it's never just let me know in the questions widget um so Oh, by the way, somebody asked, they can't see other questions that people are typing. No, you can only see your questions that you're typing, and but it's up to me to kind of monitor the questions widget as I'm going through my presentation and answer any questions that arise. Okay, um, let's see what people say. Okay, so I'm getting a lot of people saying never, rarely, never, 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 never. Um, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna close the poll, and this isn't like the best poll right now because we don't have the never category, but um, we're seeing 35% say one to two days a week, 24% say three or more days a week, 41% says I work permanently from a remote location. So we have people that are like pros at this on the webinar, and we have people that have never done this on the webinar, and then we have some people that are somewhere in between. So, all right, um, I would love to hear from, you know, when, I'm gonna go through this presentation, and for the people that are like, that have been there and done this and have been doing this, I would love your thoughts on this as well. Um, okay, as I see it, uh, and this doesn't come from any kind of like survey or article, but as I see it, I see four main challenges with remote working, okay? The first one is work habits. The second one is collaboration and office work. I mean, the actual stuff that you're doing and working with your teammates is what I mean by that. The third thing is uh, what to do when you need a physical location. And the fourth one is management. Uh, so we talked a lot about like accountability and things like that. So we're gonna go through all this kind of stuff. All right. Ah, someone says at home is a boat. So uh, for the person that works for, th for their home as a boat, do you, um, do you also work on that boat? So is the office a boat as well? I would like to hear that. That would be curious. All right, so challenges for work ha habits. We're gonna go over three, staying focused, working regular hours, and the home office setup. Okay, now um, one big tip when you are working remote uh, to keep uh, yourself in check is to pretend that you're going to an office when you're actually just going to your home office uh, or your remote location. So, um, <clears throat> If you have a morning routine, like you go for your run, you meditate, you do whatever, uh, you go to the coffee shop. So if, if you do that kind of routine the same way every day, that kind of like mentally helps you situate. The, what you don't want to do is you don't want to roll out of bed and like, you know, basically crawl over to the desk that's in your bedroom. That's like the exact opposite of what you want to do. You want to approach it as a professional. You want to have like a little area that you're going to work. We're going to talk about that as well. But a big part of that is keeping a routine. The other thing is for the most part, I mean, look, working remote, a, a big part of working remote is flex time. 
let's 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 say that right up in there. If you have a doctor's appointment, you have to go get a kid or something like that. Flex time is a big deal for uh, remote workers. It was like the number one reason why people wanted to work remote in that survey. However, that said, for the most part, if you can keep it on the rails, like you know, establish a nine to five schedule, eight thirty to five thirty, six thirty, whatever it is. The what happens if you work remote is that it can easily slide away from you, and the next thing you know, you are working constantly especially if the office is in your house. So you really need to have a way to kind of like start and stop work and know when those demarcations are, either through rituals or habits or something. But if you currently are working from home and you're finding that you're working at all hours of the day, this is a red flag. So see if you can figure out a way to dial it back in by using routines. Um, stay focused and avoid distractions. Okay, you're working from home. If you're like me, you have a beautiful little kitty cat, you have two awesome dogs, um, there's, you have guitars, you have, like, there's all sorts of awesome things that you have a very soft, inviting couch that looks awesome for a nap. So um, staying focused and avoiding distractions is a big deal. Um, that is a major challenge when you are going to be working remote. So I recommend two things. The first one, is a focusing tool called the Pomodoro Technique. I've been talking about this thing for about 10 years now. In fact, we have uh, these tomato timers uh, printed up with our logo, uh, and I give them out at trade shows. The whole idea is that you, you set this timer to 25 minutes, and uh, you work on one thing and only one thing for the duration of that 25 minutes. You don't get up and get coffee, you don't go to the bathroom, you don't check your cell phone for text, you don't check Twitter or Facebook, you just work on one thing. I had to read through a contract this week, and for me, as a software engineer, like reading through a contract is like the worst fate that can befall me in business. So I hate reading contracts. So the way I was able to knock it out was I set these tomato timers. They're called Pomodoros because the guy who invented it was Italian, and tomato in Italian is Pomodoro. So it, and um, it's a very effective technique. If you take it one step further, what you try and do is you try and count how many successful Pomodoros you've completed in one day. So if you've seen my daily planner, you'll see that there's a section for checking off Pomodoros, and that's why, because I try and like kill a couple of Pomodoros each day. Um, the other thing is checking out and getting noise-canceling headphones. The way that noise-canceling headphones work is that they don't block out everything. They kind of just block out ambient noise. But Number one, it's a good way to signal to other people in your vicinity that you are serious about work so that they should not talk to you. One of the major problems I have when I work remote is everybody thinks I'm at home and I'm not working. They just think they can ask me this or that or whatever. And no offense to the people in my house, but you know, when I have my headphones on, they're a little bit more circumspect about asking me things. Not only that, but um, you know, having the white noise, having noise canceling, listening to things like, like I find things like, like there's a website called Coffee Tivity where it sounds like a coffee shop or uh, Brian Eno's ambient music, like things like that, like really help me focus and work. So big fan of, of those tools. Um, would love to hear thoughts from anyone that's already doing things. Um, okay. All right. So somebody says they use their uh, a tomato timer on their iPhone. That's cool. There are tomato timer apps. You don't have to rush out to the grocery store and get a tomato timer. Um, let's see. People talking about managing remote em employees' productivity in hours. Um, people submitting hours, but what's some best practices? All right, so we'll get into some of that stuff. Okay, another thing is to have a ho healthy home office set up. So one thing we talked about before is like, it's if you you really should not have your work in your bedroom. Uh, my wife and I lived in Manhattan, and um, and so we had a one bedroom setup. This is before we lived in Florida, and she was a freelance. She is a freelance journalist, so she was working. We The only place we had is we set up a desk in our bedroom. That was just the only space we had. But she still went and like worked in the kitchen table, the tiny little fold-up Ikea kitchen table that we had just to get out of the bedroom. Um, so, you know, laptops are everywhere. It's easy to get a laptop. But a big no-no is to not work in your bedroom. As best you can, um, you know, set up a happy corner for yourself um, that speaks to, that, that triggers your creativity and, and things you like. Um, also, I'm a major fan of stand-up desks. 
uh, not, not necessarily stand up all day desks, but adjustable height desks. So uh, I'm not sure what this one is in the picture, but if anybody's interested, I have a great one. I can't remember the brand off the top of my head. I used to use a company called Geek Desk for a while and I replaced it with a more solidly built desk, but having the ability to like rise and sit down and rise and sit down like makes a big difference. So, um, you know, healthy home office setup, no bedroom. Okay, so that's a little bit about the home setup and some of the challenges involved in the home. What I'd like to talk about right now are the, the challenges with collaboration and office work. So this is kind of where we're gonna talk a lot about the technical tools that enable remote work. And I think for a lot of people, this is what they're looking for out of this webinar. Um, and also maybe some of the management techniques as well. Um, okay, I got a great comment, by the way. Somebody, uh, somebody put this, I find it less distracting to work from home and this is by Alicia, because my employees cannot walk into my office to ask questions whenever they want. They have to take the effort to call, text, chat, email, et cetera. And I have the option of ignoring them if I am in the middle of something, as opposed to being in an office where they were able to just walk in whenever they want. I gotta be honest, our office is kind of the same way. Um, I'm okay, uh, I, can, I have like an office and I can shut the door, but I think it's because I'm the big scary CEO that people just will not come into my office. However, like I, our head of engineering, um, the people on our marketing team, if they really have to crank and if they really have to get stuff done, they work remotely uh, because we're a little bit chatty here. Um, and you know, you go, it's, it's just very easy to get sucked into a conversation with somebody and just, uh, uh, whether it's work related or not, quite honestly. So some people actually do better working from home, especially if they have to really focus on a, a specific project. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about video conferencing worse, uh, video conferencing first. Now, you may notice that we are using GoToWebinar to conduct this meeting. Um, and GoToWebinar serves a very good purpose for us because what it allows us to do is it allows me to interact with you with the questions and it allows us, it allows you to register for the webinar. So, and it, it allows us to have like up to like a thousand people in the room. However, for the for day-to-day -day video conferencing where I just have to talk to my staff or we just have small meetings with people, in my opinion, Zoom is the way to go. We've tried GoToMeeting, we've tried Google Hangouts, we've tried Appear.in. Zoom, for, it by, for my dollar, is the most stable platform. Uh, it has the best quality video, it has the best quality audio, um, if people dissent and have dis, uh, different opinions, I would love to hear what kind of video conferencing tool they rely on. But the mobile version is awesome and the desktop version is awesome. Only good things to say about Zoom. I should get referral dollars for speaking about them. I, I really do love the product. Um, then there's uh, internal firm communication, right? Um, so, if you're still using email for internal firm communication, I'm, I'm not a fan of that anymore. I, so, so the problem that with, with email is that every time you check email, and you know this, you get sucked into something. So if, if, you, if you archive things in email and you have to go searching through your email to find something, the next thing you know, you're working on a different project. It, it's it's kind of like the Wikipedia effect. You go to look up, I don't know, you go to look up something about the Aztec empire and like five minutes later, you're reading about Jamie Lee Curtis. Like the same thing happens with uh, email. You just get, you. the reason that you go there five minutes later, you're on something completely else. So it's, it's, it's to be avoided and only used at certain times of the day, in my opinion. So how do we reduce email usage? Well, number one, uh, switch to a tool like Slack for internal firm communication. Right. Uh, the nice thing about Slack is that not only can you message people directly, but you can form these groups and talk about specific uh, situations at work. So you can form, you, they, they call them channels in Slack and, and you can add people and remove people. You can make them private. So you could have private channels related to certain matters. You could have a marketing channel where all the marketing ideas and files get shared. Um, and uh, we use it. And, and what's kind of funny is that it becomes part of the corporate culture. We have, we have a channel in Slack called Random. 
and I think it sh ships by default with Slack, like just to give you an idea to get started. So that's where people kind of joke around. And what it allows us to do is we have people in Charlotte, North Carolina, Boca Raton, Florida, and in Guatemala. And we all chit chat on this thing periodically throughout the week. And like you get people share memes and funny things happen. And it's really kind of like this like bonding thing that we have at the company. You know, obviously if somebody's going crazy on random, and they're posting all the time, we need to have a little conversation with them because they're not working too much, but it is a nice, fun thing in a, in a company culture type of thing. So it is very cool. Um, you know, also built into Rocket Matter is a communicator. And we built this because we like Slack so much and to us, it made a lot of sense for people inside of law firms to have communication around matters and direct communication and the ability to like uh, share files quickly without having to go to email. Like we loved the kind of Slack idea so much and the, the ability to skip email that we thought it made sense for law firms to have something similar already in their practice management system. And it's been adopted pretty well. And that feature is called Rocket Matter Communicator. And we're not the only cloud-based practice management software. So I want to get that out there. There's, you know, uh, we have competitors out there. We have like Clio and uh, Practice Panther. And I'm not sure what kind of needs you have or what size firm you have. And, and so it's really different depending on what size firm you have, what need you have, and so on and so forth. But when you have practice management tools that are in the cloud, uh, it allows you to organize all of your case and matter information in one place. So all the client information is one place, all the invoicing information, all your deadlines, all your tasks, all your, like all that stuff is in one place. So it allows everybody, regardless of where they are, as long as they have an internet connection to be able to check on the status of the case and instantly know what's cooking. So um, the ability to use a cloud-based tool like ours is uh, really a game changer. Now, there are um, there are different tools that are not cloud-based. So there, you you have some of the old guard practice management, and some of you may be using PC Law and Time Matters and some of the old client server stuff. Now, the only really way to work remotely with those is to uh, use a a virtual private network or a VPN to securely log into your network and kind of use those tools. The other way you can do it is you can migrate them to virtualized servers that are in the cloud and then be able to access them through like remote desktop connections. That will also allow you to work everywhere. But the original design and implementation of those tools is to be on client servers. So if you have Time Matters, PC Law, Mika's Attorney, or like one of those older kind of client server based tools, your options are as follows if you want to be a remote employee. Number one, your best option is probably to, if, if you don't want to change anything, is to remote into the firm using a secure remote desktop connection. But if you're getting sick of that, another thing that you can do is you can take what you have and you can migrate it to a cloud server. The third option is to uh, work with a company like ours to migrate your data off and move to a modern tool. So those are all possible viable paths for those of you that want to work remote that are using remote desktop solution. Um, Let's see, getting a lot of great questions. Another endorsement from Slack. Uh, how do I convince the old timers in the law firm that the remote pl workplace works uh, is what one person asked. Um, I have worked remotely with a previous employer, but my current employer will not allow it. I have a 1.5 hour commute, so I'm looking to build my own firm and work from home. Let's see, so he's currently using Slack. Listen, if you got old timers in your firm and they're not cool with the whole remote thing, point out what they're able to do at um, a firm like Fisher Broyles, you know? Um, point out point out all the advantages that like modern law firms are doing and, you know, just have a conversation about like, what is it about being on-prem that is so critical to them? I, I think having an honest conversation and really probing that is also a, a very good way to do it. And look, ultimately, you need to get experience, you know, you may not be in the position where you can just leap firms, but it is a tight labor market and there are a lot of progressive firms out there. So if you do want to jump ship and move laterally, you'll probably make more money and have a uh, better remote situation. I, I got to be honest, in, in my line of work, I mean, I've, I don't have like an old timey lawyer running Rocket Matter. Um, I have, you know, a 44 year old software executive so it's probably a totally different ball game, but I do have to let my guys work remote or else they will leave. Um, 
you know, it's hard to keep good people and I got to do whatever I can to keep them. And that includes good salaries and that includes perks like working remote. So my engineers get to work remote two days a week. And uh, most of my staff does. Um, my The person who runs support does not let the support team work remote two days a week. They She wants everybody here. Um, and they, I think they get one day a week or something like that. But uh, I do give my managers a little bit of latitude about what they need to do based on the needs of their department. Um, you know, while somebody was mentioning Slack, let me ask you guys, um, do you use uh, Slack or other communication tools aside from email? So I'm really curious to hear what people have to say about that. Um, because I really do think that you will find that if you move to a tool like Slack or our communicator tool, that you're gonna end up being a little bit more efficient because I think you're gonna spend less time getting sucked into email and suffering from tangential email, uh, email task syndrome. Um, so it turns out that by far, most people are not using a dedicated tool like Slack or communicator to be um, to, for internal communication. So I would say, you know, take a look at those. By the way, if you're a Microsoft 365 customer, if you're paying for your Microsoft 365 subscription, they have something called Teams that does this. So you may have access to something already that you're already paying for that you're not taking advantage of. So if you are using Microsoft 365, do take advantage of that. Okay. Um, all right, so if you're not paperless, going remote is going to be very difficult for you, especially if you, you, you're, you have paper files of your matters, right? So going paperless really, when we talk about paperless, uh, and we we do a lot of work with paperless, uh, it's, it allows you to kind of store your documents in one location that everybody can access. It's not just document storage though, it's electronic invoicing, like doing billing without having to print things out, stuff them in envelopes and send them out and wait for the paper checks to arrive. Um, you know, uh, it also has to do with document automation, the ability to create a document uh, with a template merged with fields from your database. So there's all sorts of like automation and performance gains aside from the whole remote access thing that going paperless provides. If you are interested in going paperless, I'm just throwing a couple of tools up here on my slides. Uh, the personal desktop scanner uh, of choice by many attorneys is the Fujitsu ScanSnap scanner. We actually integrate with this. You can scan a document, it goes right into our system. Um, and also, you know, there's Google Drive, Dropbox, Box. These things are commoditized storage uh, server things. There's net documents. There's, there's all sorts of amazing document storage tools for lawyers right now. We even have document storage in Rocket Matter. So there's uh, all sorts of different options. Storage is a commodity. It's pennies on the dollar. So if you're not paperless, I, we, we have this uh, webinar that we did with this guy named Brian Sims. And it's called How to Create and Run a Paperless Office in 2019. Um, if you don't want to wait for tomorrow to get your hands on this thing, email me, Larry at rocketmatter.com. I'm going to be sending out this presentation. And this, I have a bit.ly link, which is bit.ly forward slash rm dash paperless dash 2019. This guy, Brian, is he's, he's one of our customers and he is this like paperless office genius. And he goes into all sorts of ways to um, map out your process, um, how to handle internally created documents, how to manage externally created documents and what tools to use and PDF readers and all sorts of crazy stuff. So it, it, it is, uh, he is masterful at presenting this information and you can get a recording of the webinar there. Okay, um, for those of you that do uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of ink kind of signature type stuff, I, I'm curious how much of your stuff can be moved to digital contracts? So, I mean, I know that even share purchase agreements can be signed digitally these days. So um, loans can be signed digitally these days. So, you know, DocuSign, HelloSign, EchoSign, they're your friends. They're really good, especially for things like fee agreements, or, you know, um, engagement letters, things like that. Um, the more you can go digital, the better off you are. Personally, I like DocuSign. I don't know why that is. I haven't done a deep dive into the other products, but I would like to hear from other people uh, what products they are using. Um, by the way, okay, just let me pause for a second and look at the questions, which is some, a couple people are asking questions. Uh, so one person is, 
uh, saying, well, they want to know what scanner. That is this Fujitsu ScanSnap line of scanners is the one that I talked about. Somebody else, uh, Stephen Moon, gave a shout out for his uh, ScanSnap, loves it. Um, one question is, how secure are the various cloud-based solutions for storage of confidential documents? Okay, let's talk about security since remote has a lot to do with security. Number one, and I think, um, okay, it's a good segue into this slide. What I'm saying on this slide though is that you probably are already paying for something called a personal hotspot or a mobile hotspot. Um, on your iPhone, if you don't know about this already, um, under your settings, like the top level screen, there's a there's a screen for personal hotspot. If you click on it, uh, you can turn it on and it allows your computer to connect to your phone. So for some of you, this is, you already know this, um, but for those of you that aren't aware of this, this is a very powerful thing and it's a great backup to your regular Wi-Fi. So it's an important thing to know about if you're gonna be running a, um, a remote office. Um, and Android has a very similar setting. I used to use a Pixel 2, and I can't remember what it's exactly called. I think it was called Mobile Hotspot. I was on T-Mobile at the time, and and that's what it was called. So, um, but in terms of security and cloud-based security, right, here's, here's what you need to know. Okay, number one is that um, if you are using a cloud-based application through a browser, and you're passing back and forth very sensitive information, whether it's credit card information or client confidential information, you need to make sure that it is a secure site. So um, in the browser bar where the address is, it should say HTTPS or it should be uh, recognized with a lock, right? That will indicate that you are on, on an encrypted connection. And that is a very powerful encrypted connection. And what it means is that it's being encrypted at the browser level. So it gets encrypted in the in Chrome or Safari or Internet Explorer, whatever you're using, it gets sent out down through your machine encrypted over the wireless network that you're at encrypted all the way to the server that you're making the request from, whether it's Rocket Matter or Amazon or whatever it is encrypted, and it only gets decrypted when it gets to that server, right? So HTTPS is very secure. Your, your biggest vulnerability there is somebody peeking over your shoulder and looking at your screen. Um, now, if you're using remote desktop to get into your computer, I personally feel a lot more comfortable if you're doing it over VPN. Now, remote desktop has some of its own security features as well, but VPN, what it does is it establishes a encrypted link to the network in your office. Now, in terms of, um, that's that's encrypt, what we're talking about right now is encryption and in transit, right? Um, now let's talk about the actual security of where the data is stored. Now, not all cloud-based providers are created equal. So if you look at the ethics opinions, too bad I didn't get an ethics credit for you guys. If you look at the ethics opinions about cloud-based technologies, there's a lot um, of the, the, the answer is, can I use cloud technology? Yes, provided that you do a little due diligence and make sure that you're using a good provider, right? So um, in the the tide is beginning to turn a little bit in terms of perception of security. So it used to be that people were like, I would never trust my confidential data in the cloud. But now it's kind of like, where would you rather your confidential data be stored? Would you rather, like in our case, we host with Microsoft Azure and one of their super fortress data centers. Would you rather your data be stored on a Microsoft Azure data center? Or would you rather it be stored on you know, in, in the office next to the copy machine in a server somewhere that you're not really even sure if it's being backed up properly. So there's there's this perception now of the cloud being a lot more secure than on-prem. Now, that said, it's all relative because it depends how secure the on-prem is and it de depends how secure the cloud-based is. But if you wanna get a handle on it, you need to go to your cloud provider and you need to ask good questions. You need to be able to say, okay, for example, how do you store my data uh, at rest? Is it encrypted? How is it stored in transit? Um, do you guys do regular penetration testing? You know, there's a whole litany of questions. And if you want to know those questions, email me because I do a whole nother CLE on uh, cloud security. So email me at larry at rocketmatter.com and I can send you a whole bunch of resources. It's a good question. Okay, let me just check the questions widget uh, right now. Um, uh, 
For solo practitioners, can you talk a little bit about the basic pricing for smaller business users or what the program starts at? I think, I'm not sure if this person is asking about my specific software, but if you are a solo attorney and you haven't signed up for our service or you haven't, uh, we're experimenting with a, a, a smaller version of Rocket Matter. Um, and you can also like like an essential version that has like, very bare bones and is very affordable you can email me larry at rocketmatter.com um somebody gave a shout out shout out to a tool called citrix right signature um, they use it for di digital signaturing uh, another person asked is the webinar available later for review yes there's a lot of information here i don't want you like furiously writing everything down um, and getting writer's cramp here um, so keep the questions coming and i will ask them as they come along um, Okay, actually, let me ask this question. We have two more poll questions, so let's let's take a break right now. And the question is, um, does your law firm use a practice management tool that's used by all the employees? Something along those lines. Um, it's kind of cut off for me, I can't really see it. Um, the next thing we're gonna talk about is we're gonna talk about like what happens when you need an office. So I know this is a challenge for people because I know uh, a woman, she's a friend of mine, uh, a neighbor, she is a lawyer. In fact, when I was first starting Rocket Matter, I enlisted her help because I wanted to know what to build and you know what were the major problems that she faced. Uh, and so after raising kids, she wanted to get back into the workforce. So she started a firm and they haven't had a physical office location. They've been doing everything, meeting at each other's houses and like at Starbucks and so on and so forth. So then she comes to me and she's like, she, you know, she she wants a place where she can meet clients, conduct depositions and so on and so forth. And I said, well, there's some depo centers around where you can, you know, um, conduct depositions. She's like, yeah, but I don't really like them that much. And um, let's see what the results are while I'm telling this story. It looks like 40 percent say yes and 60 percent say no, that they don't have uh, a practice management solution that everybody's using. Uh, that's a little surprising. Um, Actually, to be honest, that is almost exactly the market data. Um, what we understand that you think about, like um, you think about what kind of um, a footprint, like Time Matters, PC Law, Clio, and us, and like all these tools that are practice management tools that you've probably heard of, they really only have like something like 40% of the market. So the the results here really match um, the market data that 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 we have as well. Um, okay, let's talk about this. So. So to, to end my story, basically, you know, what I would recommend in her case is that if she needs a place to go to meet with clients once in a while, um, I, I really like the idea of co-working spaces. Now, not all localities are going to have a co-working space, but I, you know, Bogue Raton is not really that big of a town. Um, and you have co-working co spaces available to you. I was just up in, like when I did my remote work, uh, I go to Massachusetts. Massachusetts has a small town called Pittsfield um, in Western Mass. And there's a co-working space there. There's a co-working space in an even smaller town called Great Barrington, right? Um, so, so this is the spectrum though. On the left, you have somebody going to Starbucks and setting up shop or a coffee shop, whatever. Um, in the middle is something known as a co-working space. This is actually a picture of the we working space this is our actually we working we work space. I took this with my phone in Charlotte, North Carolina. This is where our remote sales team is. And then on the right, you have something called an executive suite. That's a Regis office center. Now, here's kind of where the, the difference. If you look in the background of the executive suite, and I don't know if you can see this, uh, it's kind of hard for me to show, but um, if you look in the background of the executive suite, you see behind this couch, you see a couple of tables. So People can go there and for like 200 bucks a month, just have a place where they can plunk down. It might just be a different place, you know, every month um, or it might every time they go there, it might be a different place where they have to sit, but they have a place where they can go and get out of the office and have a place that has coffee and things like that. Um, for a little bit more money, uh, you can rent an office in a co-working space. And what's interesting about the co-working space is that usually they're based on the WeWork model. Uh, I know they've been in the news for all sorts of nonsense lately, but they've been, they, they try and foster a sense of community. So what they try and do is they, they have all these different skill sets uh, there. They have a lot of designers, a lot of startups. They even have some law firms and they try and get people to all, they, they, they host events. They try and get people talking. Um, so it's, it's a real kind of interactive experience. So it's a real nice 
vibe. If you if you haven't checked out a co-working space, I would I'll urge you to take a look at it. The nice the other nice thing is about uh, like all three of these options, including Starbucks, is that you don't really need a lease. Um, so the biggest executive suite company is Regis. They're everywhere. Uh, so this is a picture, and you know they're trying to get a little hipper um, to compete with WeWork in the co-working spaces, but they still are very staid. Uh, we rent Regis conference rooms whenever we're not Regis customers, but we'll just go rent a Regis conference room if we need a conference room for whatever. If we want to get out of the office and have a strategy session and not be bothered by anybody, we'll rent their spaces. Um, so those offer a little bit more privacy. They don't tend to foster the sense of community. They're, they tend to be more quiet, uh, more typical working environments, as opposed to the more kind of collaborative and open uh, co-working spaces. So that hopefully may explain some of the differences and they're all good options and you don't have to get tied into long-term leases. So if you are looking for a place to go, those, oh, another thing that's important to point out about that is that you can rent conference rooms usually from these places. But I think I have another slide about that. Another issue is what to do about your mail. If you want to work completely remotely or if you want to be like a roving attorney, I mean, that's going to be a little difficult if you're a litigator, but maybe if you're doing like some transactional work, you could travel the world theoretically and 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 do this kind of work. So there's two services that I personally know of. I'm curious to hear if anybody has experiences. We used Earth Class Mail ourselves, right? Um, so does anybody use um, does anybody use Earth Class Mail or Traveling Mailbox? What they do is you basically forward your mail to these people. And then you can choose whether or not to have the piece of mail scanned based on where it's from. So you you, you fully digitize your your physical mail. Uh, so so these are very useful tools if you don't want to have to deal with mail or need it delivered somewhere where you can access it from any corner of the universe. Um, somebody is already using Traveling Mailbox uh, on the webinar. That's what they said. Um, another thing in terms of physical mail delivery is a lot of times an executive suite. This is one that's here in Boca. Um, so the executive suite will offer this service. So you can have mail sent to the executive suite. They also offer, by the way, a lot of times live receptionists. You're typically not going to get that in a in a co-working space, right? But an executive suite can answer on your behalf, branded with your voice, and forward the, the call to you, right? So this is an add-on service, as you're seeing. It's $99 per month for the physical mail reception and also the receptionist. Um, Talking about receptionists, um, so let's see. Oh, and by the way, if there's any Jacksonville people on the phone, I just got a comment in here. Somebody said that uh, executive office suites in Jacksonville has an excellent day office and conference rooms. And it's, I think it's executive office suites in Jacksonville. Okay, so thank you, Lisa, for the, or thank you, Juanita, for the tip. Um, now, um, there's multiple services, like, the first time I had ever heard, heard about this was a Ruby receptionist. So I can usually tell, if I call one of my clients, if they are using one of these services, it sounds like this. It's a, thank you for calling so-and-so law firm. How may I help you today? If they're not using one of these services, it usually sounds like this, law office. So it sounds like Marge Simpson's sisters are answering the phone. And um, they're just very good at what they do. They forward to whatever number you wanna give them. Um, they, they can handle any number of different situations. Both of these services, one is Smith AI and one is Ruby, both of them integrate with us. So uh, you record a message and it injects the phone message into Rocket Matter. Um, you know, and it's, so you have a couple of different options at your fingertips if you uh, wanna take a look at this. You know, um, personally, I have never used either one, but I've heard great things about both. If anybody has an endorsement, would love to hear an endorsement. Okay, um, conference rooms and depositions, all right. Um, by the way, when I was doing this thing, I, I looked up to see if uh, Depo Depot was reserved, but obviously somebody already took it. Like, I guess it's too obvious of a name. But, um, you know, there are dedicated places with court reporters and where you can take depositions. Um, if you if you look at this picture, if you look at the right hand corner, this is the downstairs area of our WeWork space in Charlotte. And if you see, there's like a conference room with the letter A on it, and then across from it is uh, another conference room. But you can rent conference rooms at uh, executive suites and also co-working spaces. Typically, you get a certain number of allocations per month, and then you can pay additional extra 
if you need additional use of those conference rooms. So, um, you know, co-working spaces and executive office suites do serve for that purpose. So if you're, if you want to be like 99.9% remote and you really don't really want to go into an office, like my friend that I was describing before, and they really just need kind of conference room type situations and then a basic co-working space plan may work for you because in that case you really just you know or or you just rent them a la carte you know you uh the co-working space allows you to just have a table to work at and it might just and and working at a table might mean working at one of those couches that you see there too so um but it gives you access to the conference rooms it gives you access to people and let's face it coffee okay um challenges for management so this is the last section and I know that we're running long on time, so um, I'm gonna go through this kind of quickly, but all the resources are here. I'm gonna go a little bit longer if you're able to stick with me. If not, this is gonna be recorded and sent out tomorrow. Okay, so setting remote work expectations. So the first thing is, is that you have to set expectations clearly. How many days a week, how often, when people need to be reachable, and by what means should they be reachable? And you have to hold them to it. So that's just part of the ball game, right? Um, the, a big thing is to set quarterly objectives for people. So this, your, your management, the reason that we're able to do this successfully at Rocket Matter is because we use this. So we, the, there's a big, uh, thing called objective key results, OKRs. This is what Google does. That book on the left, measure what matters goes into that. That is a skim there, there, you don't have to read that one in depth. You read the first two chapters, you get the idea, and then you skim the rest of the book. Um, but the whole idea is, and I put an example uh, down here in the red box, the object, objective. Let's say that you have five objectives per quarter. Um, and we also call these rocks, like your rock for the quarter, which you have to accomplish. Um, develop new law firm rep, revenue. So let's say that everybody in the, every, every partner or you know associate has to develop new law firm revenue. Maybe, but then you're gonna evaluate them on their success on a quarterly basis. Attend three networking events, so it's measurable, right? Meet 10 new potential prospects, land two new clients, and come up with three recurring revenue ideas. Maybe we have like an idea for some sort of augmented legal service, like we can monitor this or monitor that or do a la carte or, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, business consulting on the side. So whatever it is, you know, um, this is just example of like a, an objective with four key results. So doing this on a quarterly basis and giving people like maybe three to five objectives, great idea. Cause that really helps people keep, keep people accountable. And no matter what they're doing, if they're goofing off at the end of the quarter, if they don't have their stuff done, then they don't have their stuff done. And also it gives you something to check in with them on and meet with them on, on a regular basis. Say, Hey, how's this, how's this objective doing? How's this rock doing? Um, and the book traction is also pretty great. Um, Knowing what you're measuring is critical. So in the book, The Lean Law Firm, we have a whole chapter on key performance indicators. And we also have uh, key performance indicators for marketing as well. If you go on the leanlawfirmbook.com website, you'll see all these things. Um, so having key once you have key performance indicators, you can surface them on dashboards. And this is, some, this is kind of a place that everybody can check in. You can have a TV at your office. You can have like a page that people check in on a day, you can have meetings around these dashboards and around these KPIs. And we use a tool called Gecko Board and Simple KPI to kind of radiate these uh, KPIs to the rest of the firm. So knowing what you're measuring is critical. Uh, so the other thing is you have to become a better delegator. I was a terrible delegator. I am now a very good delegator. Um, my problem is that I am not a micromanager. I do what's called um, delegation. It's, it's, it's called drive-by delegation. It's when you go past somebody and give them a whole bunch of stuff and then you run screaming in the other direction and you don't know how to keep track of it. That's my problem. There's other people who are like micromanagers that hover on top of people. That's a whole nother set of issues. So I'm in something called strategic coach. This is an entrepreneurial coaching thing. Um, and they have a book that you can download or buy, and I think it's about $20, and they have this tool that is excellent. It's called the Impact Filter. And what it does is it gives you a great roadmap on how to communicate um, projects 
or tasks to people because you have to clearly spell out, you have to think through it yourself. You have to clearly spell out what's the purpose of this? Why is it important, right? What is the success criteria? So um, it's a very great little tool. Um, it takes you like five to 10 minutes to fill this out and then you give it to somebody and then they know exactly what's expected of them. And then you can talk through the impact filter and see how things are going. So big, big fan of that. Uh, the link is down below here. Um, and the other thing is that if you are remote, it's very important to connect in person. So um, this is a picture of me and my management team. Um, you can see there are a lot more picture, a lot more people in the bottom right hand corner than the people that decided to climb the mountain. Um, we, when I'm in the Berkshires, I fly them up there, and we have a retreat and we have a strategic planning planning session for two days. So we do that twice a year. We do two day strategic plannings twice a year at the at the beginning of the year and at the mid-year mark. So that was in like late June or July. And then we have one day strategic planning sessions at a co-working space so we can get out of the office. Um, so those are one day quarterlies on, on the off quarters, right? So um, it's a great way for everybody to hang out. Um, I just interviewed another law firm from Ottawa, Canada, and they're gonna be on the Lean Law Firm podcast, I think next week, but they do retreats too. And they do things where they, they cook together, and it seems silly that you're able to talk so much more freely when you do these activities together and you build that rapport than if you just like sit down and like start a meeting. Uh, it completely changes the ability and the transparency and the accountability in the firm. So um, I have a couple of additional resources um, that we're going to send out. So there's HubSpot. There's a lot of articles on working remote. Um, this is one that we took a look at. Um, from HubSpot, five tips on becoming a successful remote worker. And it, it, they survey 450 people. Uh, there's a, the survey that I referred to earlier in the presentation. So there's a lot of really good resources in this deck. Also, we have an infographic um, that has like a lot of really quick hits, six quick hits. As a matter of fact, you'll get all of this tomorrow. Um, and I want to thank everyone for being on this. The uh, the course number is 3690. That's the Florida Bar, bar course number. Thank you very much for being with us today. Again, the course number is 3690. And if you have any questions for me, Larry at rocketmatter.com. Have a great rest of your day.